Welcome back to Saturday Mass. We have Kirk now. Uh, uh, Kirk, um, I began today apologizing for yesterday since there was so much, um, uh, so many claims made yesterday that uh, are untrue that I, I thought that it was a credibility hit to the um, the uh, program. Um, and you know, I was talking to Scott during the break, and his view was, you know, but you you, you turned it into a teaching moment uh, today to you know explain why you, you ought not uh, go towards these conspiracy theories as opposed to deal with the evidence. Um, what's your uh, what's your view? Well, I, I agree with Scott. I thought it was fine. I mean, it's not. It, people are going to have different views and come on the show, and 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 uh, you can't. You can't get them up to speed. There's so much information proving certain points of view. You can't bombard them with all of it, you know, and right. have a conversation. You let them say what you say and say, well, well, it's okay to agree to disagree at this point and then follow up later if you uh, feel it needs more clarification. Most of our audience is pretty sophisticated, I think, enough to uh, deal with that. And, you know, he's, he's got some, uh, the one thing that I walked away, I, I listened to it on tape, um, and the thing that I was walking away from is a whole week of, I've been listening to the <clears throat> news here about uh, satellites and how the World War Three starts up there in the space with knocking out all the communications and then I've, and, and but, but follow, follow this a minute. You, I By the way, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the, uh, the case. Just no, I don't think it, uh, no, but this is, I'm just saying this is what's being said out there. Right. I mean, let me tell you what, I don't think that's the case, by the way. It's just that, for example, our GPS satellites, mm -hmm. they're in extremely high orbits. And there are many, many of them. And there's only one way that I'm aware of that you can actually take one out, because they're already protected for EMP blasts. And the only way to take them out is that they, there's the way they got there, which is an intercontinental ballistic missile. Mm -hmm. And so taking out each of them is extraordinarily difficult and extraordinarily expensive. And it's not like the low Earth uh, uh, satellites. Yep. If you take out one of them, the others are not going to run into the debris because uh, the debris is going to fall below that uh, orbit level, and they're very, very far apart at very high uh, levels. And, and most of our spy satellites are very high. And, uh, and so from a communication and satellite point of view, this is a very difficult task. The low satellites, different story. Yeah. But most of the military satellites, they're, they're launching those things at intercontinental ballistic missiles. They're very, very high. Mm -hmm. But everywhere I turned, there was, like I also did the economic news uh, and, and mm -hmm. the stock market and the commodities is changing. Everyone is, is absolutely, it's not even suggested that we're in, in for some really bad times ahead. They're talking horrible times ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, and, yeah. And I, in my lifetime, I've never seen that where so many independent people are not seeing uh, even though their perspective hasn't gotten to the Torah yet and what God actually says so they can be very specific and trust him, they still, uh, the whole world now, everywhere I turn, they, they just go, my God, this this is, has to end this way badly. Yeah. Because the dollar can't survive, you know, and the one is coming and and, this, mm -hmm. this, and, 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 and on and on and on and on and everything I've read for years anyway, but still uh, it's all over. Yeah, I have. Uh, I spent this weekend down in uh, Texas with uh, both of my boys, and uh, during dinner we talked about um, where we are as a world. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sons are unique in the sense that, uh, well, you know, everybody thinks their sons are unique, but my sons actually are unique, and that they're probably the uh, the smartest siblings uh, in the world. They both have IQs over 175. It's one in like a uh, um, hundred yeah, million people. Yeah, you got it from the mom. It's a, uh, it's one in a hundred person, uh, one in a uh, hundred thousand uh, to uh, one in a million that would have an IQ above about 160-ish. Uh, so uh, to have two that are both 175, and, and the only reason I, I mention this is to, is that both have investigated the evidence. They're both very well read, uh, very well educated, and they've investigated the evidence, and both agree that it is absolutely inevitable that we're going to have total and complete societal collapse, and that that's, that collapse is somewhere between five and ten years out, and that uh, the reset is going to be extraordinarily painful, and that the reset is going to be done 
on a blend of uh, economic terms and militaristic terms. They both have come to the conclusion that the U.S. military is counterproductive, that our educational system has been a disaster, um, and that the entitlement mentality is, uh, has bankrupt uh, the, uh, the nation. And frankly, if you're looking at the evidence, you know, I was, uh, uh, Donald Trump is actually a fairly smart guy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not political, and I'm certainly not going to ascribe uh, any credibility to Trump. I think he says a lot of stupid things. But, but uh, yesterday I listened to him, and he's a very well-educated man. I went into uh, Wharton School of Finance um, and uh, was talking about his, uh, uh, his uh, what the Democrats would say is his anger, what Republicans say is a, uh, a nasty tone. And he said, listen, folks. You know, if you just think that America can resolve the fact that that we're a train wreck uh -huh. and that we, we're, things are not good here and we're, we are at the cusp of, uh, of a really, really bad situation, and you think you can resolve that without passion, without aggressiveness, without, without a, uh, a real strong drive that says, no, this isn't acceptable. Uh, and by pushing aside political correctness, I, I'm here to tell you that another president, like the ones we've had, uh, the inevitable is upon us. Uh -huh. So I agree with you. I think that it is uh, it is well known that we're on the precipice of uh, of, of total anarchy. Yeah, it's. Um, I was just amazed. It is so pervasive everywhere that they're talking this way. It's not even an option. You know, it's not. Kind of guy, they're talking as if this is inevitable. And yeah, yeah, and yeah, and, and you like still that. and you still have these discussions, like you have uh, Bernie Sanders, who will admit that he's a socialist. I would call him a communist, but he will admit that he's a socialist, drawing huge crowds, telling people that the economic system is rigged and that billionaires can't have it all, playing uh, uh, economic uh, warfare class warfare, uh, and promoting things that, that would be the same kind of rhetoric that you would have gotten out of Lenin and Karl Marx in Russia circa 1917. The and, your right, church. right. And then, and then you hear that kind of rhetoric being popular in a country that has gone down that socialistic path to bankruptcy. And people saying, yeah, man, he's the truth teller. He's enlightened. He's got this moral compass. And you go, good God, what happened to your brain? Yeah. What's, what's mor what morality is it that we all go broke? And, right. Uh, or that uh, you ought to reward people who are not productive by stealing the assets of those who have been productive. And yeah. How is that a good thing? How is that moral? Well, even, even in Greece, you, you ask them, you know, if you raise your taxes, how are you going to get anybody to invest there? And if you can't protect your investment, why would I invest there? And if I'm going to restrict your savings after I've taxed your earnings, that now I'm going to restrict your savings so that you can't take it out of the bank, mm -hmm. why would anybody invest there? Money in the bank, yeah. Right. Why would you take any risk to build a business? Yeah. So you leave. You leave? They had if you, yeah, if you have any ability, you leave. If you're a dependent, you stay. And so you get a whole country of nothing but dependents. They have people, uh, whole, several family groups all living with the same, with their family. They've all moved back in home like they do here yeah. uh, in but Greece and there. It's just terrible. You think there's a reason that Yahweh said to Abraham, who was in the, uh, the capital of the uh, most powerful um, country of its day, walk away, yeah, you, you, leave your country? You know, when you're dependent upon all of the, the, the social institutions, you're dependent upon the religion for your soul, you're dependent upon the government for your protection, the military for your protection, you're dependent upon the, uh, the, the establishment for, you know, the, the rules of the road that you operate under. When you are dependent upon government, then you're not independent enough to even process the information that Yahweh has presented, much less make an informed decision about it and walk to him. Mm -hmm. No, you're overwhelmed. Right. Uh, right. 
You can't. And did, were the governments of Babylon any different than the government of, uh, of King Saul that Yahweh warned his children about? No, he would have gotten there if they continued. Well, they did get there, didn't they? Then they well, there. yeah, he did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah, he did. He got there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, bread and circuses, and, and then, they, then if you remember in the Roman Empire, a lot of, a lot of this period, once they conquered... Um, uh, Egypt, they took, brought all the wheat in and it wiped out all the wheat farmers and, and uh, Italy. So, correct. You know, you. So why would they invest there? Why would they? Oh yeah. There? Oh yeah. And uh, Rome fell because there wasn't, there weren't any Romans that were doing anything other than plain military. Yeah. I mean, they built weapons, and they built the the means to transport their uh, weapons and the weapon wielders, and they used their weapons and the weapon wielders and the means to transport them. To uh, to rob everyone of their children, of their wealth, of their land, mm -hmm. and you know, after a while, you can't successfully, no matter how miserable and perverted and deadly, how um, just uh, uh, you know, we think of of crucifixion, which was the uh, the Romans' favorite tactic to garner compliance. I don't care how draconian you are, after a while. When you are that immoral, people will rebel against you because there's nothing to lose. And, no. no. And uh, that's the, you know, the epitome of government. If you want to know what government ultimately becomes, it's Rome. Yeah. And that's why Ted said it's going to be alive forever, till the end, probably. Right. Well, because the, the politics of Rome became the religion of Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, the religion of Rome is worse than the politics of Rome. It gives it, it gives it a reason for being. You can do that because mm -hmm. religion says so. Wow. God and King, God and King is always a good, good politics, isn't it? Yeah, you know, we were on this uh, statement in Paul when we left off, and I want to read it again. Then I want to ask you a question about the fellowship. And it says, then, having known and having recognized the grace. Now, um, having recognized the grace... Mm -hmm. um, did you uh, find any uh, grace in the uh, in the Torah when you read it? How about the prophets and Psalms? No, you have to stretch. You have, uh, well, what did, what did Yahweh say? say? I'll tell you how, what they did to the word. I mean, yeah, it would be interesting to see what did uh, Yahweh say about promoting the names of pagan gods. Says, Don't get around me with them. Mm. So it says, having known and having recognized the grace. Um, of the one having been given uh, to me, mm -hmm. the grace. Do, do you find uh, the names of, this is the Gratia. The Gratia is, uh, is how we, if you read the, uh, the Latin uh, uh, Vulgate, which was the, the principal Bible of Christianity for a better part of, uh, of uh, a thousand years, the only Bible of Christianity for a better part of a thousand years, the Latin Vulgate. Uh, the word there is gratia. Uh, that's the name of the uh, the graces, which were which was the Latin name of the charis, the uh, charities in um, in the Greek uh, religion, and the charities and the graces. In fact, having been to both of these countries, they are the most among the most prominent of the uh, the pagan uh, gods and goddesses to be displayed in Pompeii and Herculeum. On all of the uh, the decadent um, Roman villas uh, in the big living areas, it's always the gratia. Mm -hmm. And uh, like in the uh, Parthenon, it's the cherries. These were not just goddesses. They were the goddesses of, of the kind of mindset of the Greeks and the, the Romans, which was decadent. They were um, hedonistic is what their of debauchery. Now, merriment in the sense of Caligula's uh, definition of merriment. Mm -hmm. And so to, to say, he wrote this in, 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 in Greek, so he wrote the Charis. And, uh, uh, you know, this is the Christian that would say, well, you know, uh, their Jesus, uh, Yosha, uh, is uh, quoted uh, in Revelation uh, using the same word. No, he's not. No. What did he speak, and uh, what language did he speak? I think it was Hebrew. Language. Yeah, Hebrew. So it was some uh, moronic cleric 
way long after the fact that changed and translate in, in a, an attempt to translate what he said in Hebrew, which he would have said Tanan in Hebrew, mercy. Mm-hmm. That they changed mercy, Canaan, to uh, Cheris uh, after the pagan gods and then to Gratia in Latin. That was a idiotic translator in a, uh, uh, employed by some religious institution. Well, uh, to, keep, to keep my perspective intact, I went through all the Christian normal approaches of translating uh-huh. this last night. And I, I picked out about three words, uh, four mm-hmm. words, that, uh, and this is one of them. And um, you have to go, uh, they try to make it kind of on, but they try to uh, say that it's unmerited favor. And mm-hmm. you just change the definition of the word, and then you can use the word. But you have to go really away from those um, uh, lexicons in order right. to find some history lesson and find that it is the graces. Now, you don't have any right. trouble in the art field where I am, right. because up until the 19th century, it's one of the most popular themes used by all the, all the great right. painters. Because they were the most beautiful of the beautiful forms. Oh, uh, they uh, draw three naked okay. women, you know, and nobody right. cares. And the right. it's okay because they're the graces. Right, they're the graces. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what yeah. you got around the uh, more um, circumspect uh, preachers and all, or priests. And so you can mm-hmm. do, do anything as long as it's mythology. So right. I really they gravitated to those things. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, now... now the, the, uh, no, no, I, I, I agree with what you're saying about the etymological deriv- derivation of the word, right. uh, the, you know, phrase. Or, but uh, uh, a, linguist, <laughs> a linguist might make an argument that words over time can mm-hmm. be fairly divorced from their etymological origins, so such that, you know, when a modern Spanish speaker says gracias or an Italian says god, mm-hmm. he's not thinking of these goddesses at Correct. all, you know. He's, all, all he's, right. Right. Or when we use the word gratitude, right. we're not realizing it. Right. You know, but let's not forget that we're on a, on a re- regular basis saying mm-hmm. Woden's Day, Thor's Day, Tuesday, mm-hmm. and the previous okay. day. And what, what, you, what, what, you've said, day what you've said is true, but it doesn't exonerate Paul. Paul wrote right, this right, in, right. In, uh, in 50 uh, to 52 CE, and in 52 CE, Cheris was the name of those goddesses, period. Right, right. And so it, it absolutely, the, the fact that Christians have tried to disassociate Cheris from gratia and gratia from grace and to evolve a, a concept uh, for it that is satisfactory for their religion, to divorce it from Dionysus and uh, the, the charities, uh, I, is true, but it doesn't exonerate Paul. What Paul wrote also, was, was absolutely pagan at the time that he wrote it. it, it, it there was no evolution of the word at the time that uh, in 52 CE. When uh, that so pen... Did God, so did God inspire him to say that? I don't think so. Zero chance. Did the disciples... Could the disciples have seen the perversion of the uh, of the Cheris uh, and Paul? Absolutely. <laughs> Is it a good thing? No. So if we get by uh, this uh, use of the pagan goddess's uh, name, Cheris and Paul's uh, nomenclature, Gratia by the Roman Catholic Church and grace by Christianity today. Uh, he says that, uh, and having recognized and known the grace uh, of the one having been given uh, to me, uh, uh, Kephesh and Jacob Kephesh and Yaukanan. It's interesting, he starts with Jacob, who despised him, and Shimon Kefesh, who despised him, and Yao Kanan, who uh, essentially was pitted against him. Uh, I mean, the whole experience, all of Revelation's open letter to, uh, to the Ephesians and uh, Paul's letters to Timothy are about the battles between Yao Kanan and, um, and uh, Paul, John and Paul. And uh, uh, the second letter that uh, that Peter wrote, uh, Shimon Kepesh, um, pits uh, Peter against Paul. And in this uh, letter, he Paul is pitting himself against all three. In the entire book of Jacob, there isn't a Christian in the world that doesn't understand the book of Jacob. 
was written, of James, was written expressly to, to contradict Paul. And yet, he's claiming that these three guys uh, reached out to him. Now, he, he does something here that's really important first. He associates them with Dokii, the ones that were presently presumed and regarded to be pillars. So he's telling you that the people whose message meant nothing to him, that he totally rejected, that were, uh, were false, were these three guys, the three disciples. So he's affirming what we, we've said on previous programs. And then he says that they gave him the right hand of fellowship. Why would uh, James write a letter, Jacob, condemning Pauline Christianity? Why would Yosha speak of the false apostle that was opposed to, uh, to Yahu Kanan in Ephesus? Why would Shimon Kephesh say that Paul's letters were, were misleading and counterproductive and lead people away from Yahweh? If, in fact, this was the right hand of fellowship? Some fellowship, huh? Well, even further, that that being true, uh, it's, it's very awkward because I, I tried to translate it into English from the Greek, and mm-hmm. the only way you can do this properly, and, and to me, you would have to say supposed. He said that they were supposed pillars. pillars. Right. Now, when supposed. You say something like supposed, or I might say supposedly, these guys are the pillars of a community, or something. And that is that is such a um, sarcastic way to say mm-hmm. something about someone. Yes, Which, demeaning. Yeah, demeaning. Totally, demeaning. Then, then you demeaning. Around and, yes, and so he he's, he has dismissed them, and right. then he's saying that their their uh, endorsement is somehow uh, right worth your noting. Oh, are you not? right? Yeah, you're just you. Have, no matter how you look at this, it is so reprehensible, so disgusting, so uh, irresponsible, so irrational. That the fact that a religion grew out of this, that the most popular religion in the world, just speaks of how thoughtless most people are. You know, yeah, and, and the people that he was demeaning. I mean, listen, we demean people all the time on this show. Oh yeah. And we demean the uh, the pillars of society. We don't call them the supposed pillars of society. The pillars of society: military leaders, uh, uh, political uh, leaders, religious leaders, and we're exposing them and condemning them all the time. We don't call them supposed. Because they are the, the very people that are responsible for these counterproductive institutions. But he is here demeaning Yosha's disciples, and not just the disciples, the big three. Mm-hmm. That's like saying, you know, this guy that I'm claiming I'm speaking on behalf of, he was an idiot. He picked these three idiots and so I'm just going to call the ones that he picked and trained and sent out and equipped and empowered, I'm going to call them supposed pillars, presumed pillars, to demean them. And then it's important that they endorse me. <laughs> now, they said they are their right hand in fellowship. When Yahweh is talking about fellowship in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, what is the basis of fellowship with man? Well, it's, a, it's an honorable place. It's, um, you're becoming part of the family. or you're, Yeah, the family, the covenant, right? Yeah. Every reference to fellowship uh, and, uh, in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms is based on the covenant. Is, uh, is offering a right hand one of the conditions of uh, the covenant? Well, I don't know if I'd put it that way, but I mean, it's... it's um... Does she, I mean, you always got five conditions. The covenant is, is uh, offering oh, a right hand five uh, conditions. Sure, five niggers, five didn't. Okay. But no, but 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 is uh, no. I'm, I'm just saying that Paul is claiming that uh, that in his fellowship, that the sign of this uh, of this fellowship is the offering of the right hand. Uh, I'm uh, reading uh, and I've read the terms and conditions of the covenant. Mm-hmm. There is no condition that says that no, the no, sign no. Uh, the sign of acceptance into the fellowship is offering of the right hand. The sign of acceptance of the covenant is circumcision. Yes. Not offering the right hand. Yes. 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 So what is he talking about here? I mean, if if he wanted to say, you know, you're part of the you're part of the club, then circumcision is the sign. Not offering the right hand. I'm still trying to figure out how he could have said the first line because the meeting was done in Hebrew, not in Greek. Correct. Uh, how did you How did you get the grace in the Hebrew? <laughs> I mean, so we, know, we know, he's, we know he's not repeating something that actually was said there. Uh, well, 
because he's writing to uh, to Greeks and to, and he's writing to Greeks and Romans, and the Greeks and Romans loved their naked little girls, uh-huh. and the naked little girls are part and parcel of the Dionysus uh, cult, and they and Paul was all over that Dionysus cult, man. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, is so many, is so many internal evidences in here that would prove that this is just a false BS he's made up. Oh, of course. That that how does how does it gain traction? Yeah. How does it gain traction? I mean, I'm not, people. So smart. I'm not that smart. Uh, you know, I, I, and and I can dig a little bit and 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 start asking these questions that don't make any sense and and I'm, and I'm. Listen, I don't think it's about smart. I think smart can help you. And uh, smart is typically uh, processing, uh, you know, processing information quickly is uh, uh, is the kind of the definition of uh, of smart. But uh, knowing these things, every Christian knows that this is uh, in Galatians two nine. Every uh, uh, scholarly Christian and understanding are two different things. What you possess is a vastly more important thing. Than, uh, than necessarily being smart. That's understanding. Mm-hmm. And we are all capable of understanding. It just requires the proper perspective and a, uh, an affinity for evidence, a desire to learn what can be known, and then making the necessary connections. We're all capable of understanding, no matter how fast or slow we process information. So yeah, it's it's obvious to you. It's obvious to me because yeah. we understand. And and then you go to the tablets of stones, and you you can't have gods with me, behind me, beside, beside me. Don't come around with that stuff. And yeah, I mean the first the so first you know, statement. Yeah, you, right, you will not exist with other gods in my presence. Right, you will not. But what part of that sounds like uh, he's going to accommodate uh, right. the, the gratia, the charis, the charities, and the graces? Yeah. Right. You will not exist with other gods in my presence. That's the first statement he gets in stone. Right, right. The, um, yeah, that, the, um, yeah. I was going to say some of these, if you look at the English translations of the words, so it's like a mercy, grace, or charity as agape, you know, to right. love. So most, a lot of Christians don't, like, understand the distinction even between mercy and grace. They think them as similar words, like just kind of mean nice or kind. Right. Uh, grace, if, if grace is translated as unmerited favor, mercy is actually more so as healing. But, right. um, you know, but, you know, so, you know, I understand the, the importance of parsing all this stuff and making these points. Um, but actually, I want to point out there, there is a good case for, uh, apart from the word controversy, making the case that much of, uh, you know, the favor is unmerited. I mean, uh-huh, sure. it was un- 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 unmerited that, you know, a call Abraham out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're, if, if you're, gonna, if you're, gonna, if you're going to, if you're going to understand and translate uh, Chanon uh, and understand what Chanon means, like Yao Kanan, if you're going to understand the concept of Chanon, which is uh, unmerited favor, uh uh, and uh, mercy. I got no. I've got. I mean, no issue with that at all. But uh, don't. We didn't know the Hebrew word. We didn't know the Hebrew word, but wanted to make the point of the importance of the concept. You know. Right. And, and by the way, the there were there were Greek words that weren't the name of pagan goddesses that communicate the concept of mercy, of undeserved favor, and there's about six of them. And uh, one and one and one of them was not the name of the pagan goddesses. So he chose the name of the pagan goddesses as opposed to choosing the Greek words that properly translate the concept of Chanan, of mercy. Right, right. So why don't the translators of the future Bibles, why didn't they change it back to unmerited favor? Because they have the gospel of grace. I know. Because Christianity is based on the gospel of grace. What is, you know, so who's the, who is the... Why did the publishers of English Bibles uh, write to the Lord as opposed to Yahweh's name? No. So it just attacked, you know, it's them. Right. No place for them to hide. No place for them to hide. They, uh, they deliberately and knowingly perpetuate the lie because the lie is what enriches them and empowers them. And if you were a victim of that lie, shame on you. Now this, of course, ends... With uh, a uh, after it has the word fellowship, which uh, the, according to Yahweh, there's only and, and by the way, it's, it's koinonia, which is very interesting. 
that Christians will, will use the word koinonia all the time. It's one of the Christians' favorite words is koinonia. And they'll use that to speak of fellowship as opposed to bereft covenant, because they just hate Hebrew, not knowing that Yosha and God and the other one never once spoke Greek. So here you are with, uh, with uh, koinonia, and, and yet this koinonia is entirely different, because he went on, goes on to say, we, he's speaking of himself and Barnabas, who is soon going to be leaving him. So we, so you got to extract Barnabas there, because Barnabas is bye-bye. To the nations and ethnicities, to the ethnos, but they, to the circumcision. Okay, now let me throw something in. Okay. Uh, I, well, we may have to go to break, but uh, I was told that Matthew dies in Egypt, uh, Thomas dies in India, Peter obviously in Rome, John got, grew old in, in, in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. in Ephesus. Uh, what are they doing there if they were just going to the circumcision? Who's lying? History? Or Paul? Yosha? Or Paul? If their message was the same, if their inspiration was the same, if they represented to save God, since they were both Jews, all Jews, why would Yao Kanans, Shimon Kefesh, and Jacobs, James, Peter, and John's message be wholly limited to circumcision, while um, Paul, uh, based upon this, has the rest of the world. And why is it, as you said, that these three guys all ended up outside of the world of Israel, if what Paul was saying was true? Good question. Every time that we did a whole show on, uh, the, because uh, James had sent us the references, every time that uh, Yahweh used the term uncircumcision. And every time Yahweh uses the term uncircumcision, which is the group that Paul claimed that he had, that was his message. He was, he was reaching out uh, the message and preaching the message of uncircumcision. Every time Yahweh mentions uncircumcision without fail. Derogatory. It's derogatory. It's failed inadequate, uh, disgusting, distance, estranged from him, mm -hmm. deadly, unacceptable. unacceptable. And here's Paul saying, that's my message, man. I am the message of uncircumcision, of failure, of derogatory, of opposition to, uh, to God, mm -hmm. of unacceptable. Well, you, you're just turning down the covenant contract. If you don't want to sign the contract, don't sign the contract. We don't claim you signed the contract if you ain't going to abide by it. Oh, and more importantly, don't claim that you're speaking on behalf of the God who signed the contract. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this ain't complicated stuff here. Yeah. And yeah, he claims that, you know, his religion is, uh, is faith-based because uh, Abraham didn't have the Torah and that Abraham uh, accepted righteousness based upon faith. Which is, you know, so he's talking about that same Torah. Mm -hmm. And yet, what did Yahweh tell uh, Abraham that he absolutely had to do if he wanted to be part of the covenant? Yeah, he had to be circumcised. Right. And where does it say that Abraham had faith? Uh, nowhere. Because it's not, it's not the word used. No. Trust, trust and reliability is a right. word. In right. Right. Exa exactly, because he knew him personally. Mm -hmm. And so, all the way through here. What you've got is Paul not only lying, but the lie is is veneer thin. And he's putting this veneer right over the truth. Question. Yeah. Where did Abraham find a moil? <laughs> yeah. Don't you think it's interesting that, uh, you know, when you, you study the story of King Saul, King Saul uh, ultimately... Uh, uh, I mean, he falls apart for a lot of reasons, but his, the big issue that's chronicled uh, with uh, King Saul is that uh, he imposed uh, a, um, a set of rules on what his, uh, his uh, army could eat and, uh, and how they would go about preparing the meat for, uh, to eat that was his own set of, of laws. And then 
condemned his own army when they didn't follow his laws, which were you know, unstated in the Torah. He was, so he was adding to the, the Torah based upon his own set of, uh, of laws. Yeah, now, you know. mentioned a, uh, how would they find a, uh, a rabbi to do a brisk when, uh, when it, you know, I was taking with Abraham? You know, it doesn't say how much to cut off. He doesn't say there's any ceremony involved in, in, uh, in doing the clipping. He uh, doesn't say who has to do the clipping. It's, it's strictly a sign. It's, it's something that, uh, that is uh, done that, that Yahweh doesn't want us all caught up in, in how much, by whom, and where. It's just the, uh, the when and why. Right. And yeah, there's exactly. no back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, it's, you know, it's, you know the, the very fact for an adult that uh, without, uh, you know, Novocaine, uh, that there would be some discomfort for a very short period of time associated with this, that you're doing something and, uh, uh, and essentially you're, you're signing your, uh, your commitment to participate in the, uh, the covenant at a personal expense and with some blood is um, uh, important. Uh, you know, Chanan, mercy, is undeserved, but it doesn't make you free. No. You're free to choose it. You're free to avail yourself of it. But just because it's undeserved doesn't mean that it's without action. This idea of the gospel of grace where you're saved by faith and not of anything that you yourself have done is the antithesis of what Yahweh says. You want to participate in the covenant. There's a lot that you need to do. We'll be back tomorrow.